You know, I was thinking about tax, and Ulrich said tax has created the, the, the most criminals, and I agree, and it's even creating criminals out of taxpayers. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when Barron was the Minister of Finance? All the bumper stickers said, don't steal, Barron hates competition. <laughs> but I haven't seen those stickers nowadays. I've got to figure out, just, I'm being a bit mischievous, but let's get it out of my system first, and then we go on to the detail. I'm going to write down a number. This out. Okay. Right, let's work this out. I've got enough zeros. Right, let's work this out. Hundreds, thousands, millions, trillions. No? Nope. Quadrillions. I've got enough now. Hundreds, thousands, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions, quintillions, sestillions. That's it. 89.7 sestillion percent. And I bet nobody can guess what that number is. That's the inflation rate in Zimbabwe in November 2008. And the best part was you were not allowed to keep your books of account in any currency other than Zim dollars. <laughs> I don't think there was a, a computer program that could take so many zeros, so their tax system totally crashed. Anyway, there were people, say, 50 years ago, who thought, look, the rand is going south, so they better make a plan. Who would have thought? And they took their travel allowance out and invested overseas bit by bit by bit. Zim did the same thing. And in those days, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have computers. People were too scared to keep records of the overseas investment. So it just grew. People would go overseas, look at the bank statements, then destroy it, and it would grow. Now today, of course, it might come to quite a lot of money. And um, they couldn't put in their tax return because they knew the tax people spoke to the Reserve Bank people, and they just buried their heads in the sand and forgot all about it. But meanwhile, this money overseas was growing, and the income was growing, and um, we had a, an amnesty coming in in 2003, and um, some people went for the, the, the Tax and Exchange Control Joint Amnesty at that time because they thought it was a good idea. They actually trusted and believed our government which was a good thing because they weren't hounded and they weren't signaled for special treatment. Others didn't really trust the government at that stage, so they didn't go for the amnesty. And, um, you know, the thing with exchange control is this. Let's say we drop exchange control today and you can take out as much money as you like. That doesn't mean back in the day when we had the law that you didn't break the law. In terms of our law, if you took money out of the country when you weren't allowed to, the fact that maybe the law drops away today, it doesn't make you any less a criminal. You can still be prosecuted for what you did back in the day. So the idea of this amnesty is twofold, because now what is happening, as you, you've no doubt read, I'm sure you've never experienced it, but you've no doubt read it, that governments are starting to get their act together. And what's happening, they're starting to share information tax information, not so much exchange control information. I mean, an overseas, you, you, South African would take his money overseas, and the uh, overseas uh, people, would bank would say, where did this money come from? So it says from after-tax income, they'll say, well, that's good, tick that box. But I smuggled it out in contravention of exchange controls. They'll say, what are exchange controls? they say, well, this is something we have in South Africa. And they say, well, we don't have it here. And um, therefore, if it's not a crime here, we, we couldn't care. We, not, um, we don't really care about another sovereign country's laws that we don't have. Like murder is a crime everywhere. So if you kill somebody in South Africa, or you caught Patagonian toothfish, don't think that if you leave some and go to another country, they won't think it's a crime. But exchange control was a bit of an issue, and I think we slowly... Um, getting to the point where one day we'll, we'll be a developed country where it may not be such an issue. Um, but anyway, people sit in the position and governments are getting the act together to say, all right, now what happens is um, a bank will come to a taxpayer and say, listen, um, you've got a bank account in Switzerland, 
um, what is your name? We you know, what is your address? And you can't say, I live nowhere. I'm three months in South Africa, and three months in Mauritius, and three months in the Bahamas, and three months in Italy. That doesn't fly anymore. Banks like tax authorities say everybody <coughs> has a home somewhere. Nobody lives nowhere. We have to accept. Then you say, all right, I live in... And you can't... One guy, one of my clients, tried just to travel. He thought, I'm leaving South Africa, and I'm not going back. But I'm not settling anywhere. I'm going to be a citizen of the world to not be resident here, not be part in the tax club. And he started traveling, and he found that uh, it's very hard because the German guys would look at his passport and say, you know, you've been in and out of Germany five times in the last six months, and you haven't been back to South Africa. And we see you've been to the Bahamas, you've been to Italy, you've been to Mauritius. Come to the back room, we've got some questions for you. <laughs> and he says he sat in so many back rooms for so many hours, he eventually thought, wait, he better settle somewhere. So he can say, I live there, here's my tax number. I reckon this, there must be, you know, if some country in the world was entrepreneurial, they would sell addresses and tax numbers. So you can say, I live there, here's my tax number, and then they could tick that box. So anyway, what's going to happen is the banks will say, and the portfolio managers, all the reporting institutions will have to say, where do you live, what's your tax number, because we've got to report all the movements on your bank account to our authorities. And this guy, Graham's going to talk about this automatic exchange of information, and um, we will eventually get it, and I'm sure that our revenue service and treasury have computer guys working furiously to send out computer-generated letters when they get this information, and you're going to get a letter saying, Dear Sir, <clears throat> please fill in the attached form because we know to share a bank account in Panama, whatever. <laughs> and now you've got to fill in the form. <laughs> and they'll have sort of questions there. When did you open the account? How much money did you put in? How long have you had? And you're going to get all these rather uncomfortable questions that this computer is going to be asking you. And... Um, you can draw funny pictures and blues on it, and he made it back because the computer can't read it, and once a human being actually gets to it, they'll say, wait a minute, this guy's taking the mickey, let's find out what's going on. So those forms are going to start <coughs> arriving, and so people are saying, wait a minute, we better get our act together before that happens. And I know the chap from the Swiss banks have been very unhappy about this whole thing. You know, Switzerland, I mean, they couldn't really, or most of the countries couldn't really be bothered with, with filling in all these forms and sending all this information to the authorities, which must then go all around the world to all these countries. Um, I suppose it's much easier just to leak documents. <laughs> One guy came to me and said, Philip, I've smuggled millions out of Zimbabwe. So I said, when? He says, you know, we had this inflation which went up to the 89.7, 69%. There were guys who made money out of it. They didn't go short on the Zim dollar, they just made money in a big way out of it. And he said, I smuggled all this money out of Zimbabwe. So I said, did you smuggle any money out of South Africa? He said, no. I said, well, then why am I worried? Because we don't care about other countries, and it's not our job to care about other countries. And I forgot what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, when, the, when the, there was a leak, HSBC Geneva, his name and his daughter's name was what was leaked, and um, the Zim details. And um, they live in South Africa now, as probably quite a lot of Zimbabwe does. And his daughter said, I'm going back to Zim for a wedding, Dad. And he says, please, they, they're going to lock you up. You can't go back for a wedding. I think she's been back for five weddings. I don't know if they've got internet there or electricity <laughs> work or whatever. Um, so so they, seem to be, they seem to be okay. I worry, though, that in South Africa we might be a little more jacked up. Our revenue service is quite good. It's amongst the best in the world. <coughs> Obviously, there's a lot wrong with it. Um, you talk to any accountant, you will hear huge horror stories. I mean, that's just par for the course. But they're better than home affairs. They're better than a lot of government departments. And they're slowly getting their act together. So we need to get our act together. So anyway, they brought in the special VDP. Now, there is a VDP, um, it's, uh, 
it's a permanent VDP we've got, and they, they're keeping that intact. And um, in the budget, the minister announced a special voluntary disclosure program in respect of offshore assets and income. Now, let's just see. I've got it. I've got it. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. <coughs> special voluntary disclosure program. And that's in addition to the normal voluntary disclosure program. So for people who, who want to come clean, and I find it's mostly older people who want to make sure everything's sorted out before they die, because they don't want to get to heaven, and somebody there's waiting for them, or maybe when their kids get to heaven, eventually they beat them up, so they want to get stuff sorted out now, while they're still alive. I find old people don't seem to worry about dying as much as we think they should. I'm old. Uh, they don't, so they want to get things together. They might have smuggled money out the country over the years because it was the RAND was going south. And of course the RAND did strengthen after 94, we all know why. Now it's heading south again at a rate of knots and we all know why. Um, so so um, money nowadays might be quite a lot overseas which hasn't been disclosed for tax and exchange control. So they mention there's this new global standard for the automatic exchange of information between tax authorities. So really, people who've got overseas funds are almost forced to come clean now. Because if you don't, you're going to get these uncomfortable questions about what are these bank accounts, what are these overseas trusts, what are these investments that you've got all this information on. And Graham and Sanal will tell you more about how the, the detail of that works. So now you've got to say, well, now I'm forced to come clean. And um, they've got the special voluntary disclosure program for individuals and companies for this limited window period. From the um, 1st of October, you'll see... Um, from the 1st of October to the 31st of March uh, to 2017. Let's see, this has got a point. There we go, six months, 1st of October this year to the 31st of March 2017. And you can understand the logic of them pushing it out to them, because they've got to work out law. And working out law on this is not going to be easy, because there are just so many ways that people did things. You know, you've got the, the, the normal way, somebody takes their money and puts it in the bank, and it just keeps going into the bank, and it just keeps building up, and it's been building up since 1963. And now today it's a certain amount. So that's easy. That person's easy. Well, relatively, we'll get to the difficulty at the moment. But then you've got some people who form trusts, and those trusts have decanted into other trusts, and the trusts have decanted, gone into bank accounts, and then gone back into trusts, and some money's come back to South Africa, and it's gone back overseas, partly illegally, partly illegally, and it gets quite complicated. Um, so it's going to take them a while to work out the law. So I think that's why they've got that six month period. There's pressure on uh, the, the Revenue Service and the Reserve Bank to increase that period, to make it longer. Because you can imagine the accountant's hands are going to be full trying to work out what has to be disclosed. Um, they, they say there you can have an initial no-name approach. An initial no-name approach which is quite useful uh, from the point of view you can say to the revenue, listen, this is the situation I got, these are the records that I'm able to get. Obviously you can never get all the records, that's absolutely and utterly impossible. Um, how do we go forward? And so you can have a no-name approach. South African trusts do not qualify uh, for some weird and wonderful unknown reason, but they don't, they didn't qualify in the last amnesty. Either. But settlers, donors, deceased estates, or beneficiaries of foreign discretion and trust may ever participate. I think the thinking there is to the reason they don't want South African trusts to qualify is they want to pull these assets into the South African tax net of individuals. They haven't done it too well yet, but they try. And then um, if you've already been audited, you may not apply. <coughs> I get to the next page. We've got it. Ah. 
Now, I'm not going to go into the detail, I'm going to go into the act. That's the background. Exchange control relief, I just want to touch on that. Um, they've said um, they will give relief under Regulation 24 of the Exchange Control Regulations. Now, they had that in the last amnesty as well. And interestingly, if you read Regulation 24, it says, for example, if you've got overseas assets, you have to have them valued. Um, fixed property has to be valued. If you've got shares or bank accounts, they'll accept the financial um, records, the portfolio statements, the bank statements, etc. Um, and Regulation 24 actually allows exchange control to give you amnesty with no penalty. But they've said here what they're going to do um, they're going to charge a penalty. First of all, they're going to want to know your assets as at the 29th of February 2016. So you've got to go now to your overseas bank, your overseas um, broker, your overseas trustees, and say, guys, I need the value of the figures at that date, uh, the value of the assets at that date. Um, and here's the, the, the levy they're going to charge, 5% um, if you bring the money back to South Africa, 10% if you keep the money offshore, and that's the assets on hand at the end of February 2016. Now, the one thing is you'd say, all right, but I've got no assets on hand at the end of February 2016. They're all in a foreign trust. Good for you. Then 10% of nothing is nothing. But it doesn't mean they're not going to pursue you. That's why they give you the option of electing to be the holder of the assets in the foreign trust, so then you've got something to pay the 10% on. Then they clear those assets. And um, they don't seem to worry about assets you've drawn out and spent before then. They're only looking at that point in time. So maybe you went and you bought a, a, a farm in Australia, and Australia would obviously tax you to death on that, uh, but maybe you made big losses, so by the end of Feb, 2016, you've got a very small amount left, and that's what you pay your, your amnesty levy on, and then you're in the clear. And not worried that you might have taken out a lot more than that um, and lost it. Um, so that's, um, and you're not allowed to deduct your 10 million rand foreign capital allowed. I must say, you know, with this coming, people say, well, you know, um, Maybe I should just leave the country and, and, and hey, get a foreign address and not be here so that when the bank reports I'm not here. It's amazing how many people are leaving the country. But you know, South Africa is a beautiful country. And I found this um, infographic on the internet, but I didn't find it. Somebody sent it to me. And it's interesting. You've got all these green bubbles and it says, which world-class cities are the ultra-rich scrambling to get into? Which are they avoiding? I see Paris is a red bubble, so they're getting out of Paris. Who knows why? Vancouver is a big green bubble. That's the price <coughs> in the price of property in Vancouver in 2015, 25%. Monaco is a big green bubble. It's all the Russians moving in there, I'd imagine. That's obviously net of inflow and outflow. Dubai is a big red bubble. People getting out of there. Singapore, they're getting out of. Cape Town, they're getting into 7% increase in the price of property in Cape Town. Cape Town's a beautiful country, beautiful city. It's Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> you know the old joke? How do you know when somebody's from Cape Town? When you meet them, it's the first thing they tell you. Hi, I'm from Cape Town. <laughs> um, so Cape Town's a beautiful city, and we've got people flooding in. Um, I know that you would know as well that um, that's on paper they're flooding in. The Cape Townians know of other places in South Africa much more beautiful than Cape Town, but they're not telling. <laughs> and I'm sure you know about those as well. Right, so that's it. Interestingly, these guys who produce this infographic, as they call it, have produced another one about the ten most miserable countries in the world. And South Africa's number five. We're the fifth most miserable country in the world. Venezuela's number one. Okay, we can understand why Venezuela's done. Uh, apparently, South Africa is the fifth most miserable because we've got a 60% youth unemployment rate. 
I can understand it. Find a youth one day and, and say to them, and just do me, do yourself a favor. Just write down, just write down this number. I've got to turn the page here. Just write, find a youth and write down that, this number. Any youth, Chinese, Indian, white, black, doesn't matter. Write down that number. Ask them to tell you what that number is. You may be surprised. You say, I was surprised. <laughs> I only moved in. Couldn't read a million. You couldn't read it. So I think we can forgive our president for not knowing <laughs> what, the price, what the price of his new jet's going to be. <laughs> I saw a good quote this morning which made me think. It said, the secret to success is to appear to be a fool but to be wise. I thought there are some presidents of countries that do that, and maybe <laughs> even some aspiring presidents. <laughs> Who knows? Let's look at the actual law. Um, there's a draft bill that's come out, and this bill was dated, I think, the 24th of um, the 24th of April. Let me check. 12th of April, and um, they've had a go at um, the law. And they said, for people who want a special amnesty, you just application is an application for additional relief, and it says made under Part B of Chapter 16 of the Tax Admin Act, which is the same rules for the normal amnesty. So what you've got to do, and I've always got these hypothetical people, and somebody come to see me and say, Philip, I've got this hypothetical question for you. I said, I'll give you a hypothetical answer. <laughs> I've got this hypothetical friend, Mr. B. So I said, okay, Brian, let's talk about it. <laughs> and uh, we go on. Um, but now what you do, you work out Mr. B's tax payable if he applies for amnesty under the normal amnesty. And you'll say, under the normal amnesty, this is your tax payable. Then you'd work out the tax payable under the special amnesty, and say under the special amnesty, this is your tax payable, and obviously you're going to go for the better one. The difficulty between the two is this. Under the normal amnesty, if you're looking at overseas assets, which is all the special amnesty applies to, South Africa went on to a worldwide tax system on the 1st of March 2001. Capital gains tax came in on the 1st of October 2001. So before March 2001, we were on a source-based tax system. So if somebody was working overseas prior to March 2001, and they earned a salary and put their salary into an offshore trust, we couldn't care. It's got nothing to do with us. We couldn't tax it because it was before we went on to the worldwide system. We had in the nation's tax exemption for donating offshore salaries to offshore trusts, so we really didn't care. Um, when we went on to a worldwide tax system in March 01, suddenly your offshore earnings became important. And um, if you take the normal tax amnesty for overseas assets, theoretically you should go back to 1st of March 2001 and have all your interest income, your dividend income, your rental income from overseas on hand. Where are you going to get records? Who knows? And that's the difficulty. And showing that the investment came out of, let's say, after-tax income, or income that shouldn't have been taxed, is a difficulty. And our revenue, bless their hearts, have said to some taxpayers, listen, we're just going to assume that that money overseas came out of pre-tax income, so we're going to tax it. And then the guy says, but it didn't. And I can't prove otherwise. And they said, fine, you either accept pre-tax it, or you don't get amnesty. Uh, which I think is rather dodgy, but um, it happened uh, once or twice, and so people are on nervous about the normal amnesty. Now we look at the special amnesty, and now let's look at that. Um, the actual law, I think it's this one, yeah, this one. The additional amnesty, they say there, this is their first shot at it, they say they must be exempt from normal tax. I've got a pointer. They must be exempt from normal tax and amount determined in accordance with subsection 2. 
in respect of additional relief under the VDP, Voluntary Disclosure Program. So this is an additional amnesty. Um, in respect of which person has made application, that's a normal E5 in form you fill in, and we've entered into a Voluntary Disclosure Agreement, uh, where the revenue have agreed that they will give you amnesty and that you don't know how much tax and interest you'll pay. And the amount contemplated in subsection 1, which must be exempt from normal tax, is 50% of the amount used to fund the acquisition of assets situated outside the Republic, if those assets were acquired before 1 March 2015. Now, I know in Pretoria today, at Treasury, they're holding a workshop on this. And I've got some people who've gone up there and they're going to give me feedback on what this means. But let's look at it. 50% of the amount is, is exempt, which implies you can only exempt something if it was taxable in the first place. <coughs> so if it wasn't taxable in the first place, how did you exempt it? So that's a puzzle. So are they saying, if it's out of pre-tax income, we will exempt 50% of it? Is that what they're saying? to fund the acquisition of assets that were acquired before the 1st of March. Well, you'll say, I acquired a lot of assets before the 1st of March. I bought those shares and I sold them. And I bought those shares and I sold them. And I bought those shares and I sold them. Which assets are you talking about? Are you looking at what funded the latest assets? Or what funded all the assets? Or what funded the first assets? So, you don't know if revenue just said, look, we'll just have a shot at this. Ask for submissions and get the get the profession to write the right rule for us, rather than we write it. If you try to make sense of it, if you were a judge and you had to make sense of it in the tax court, judges have a problem because, according to them, the tax act is written by mechanics and they are engineers and they, it's like a car being built by a mechanic and an engineer's got to change the oil and fix it. It's sort of back to front. So they would look at this and say. This doesn't make sense, so they've got to try to make sense of it. So if you, the way I read this, because exchange control is charging you a levy based on the assets on hand in Feb 2016, maybe they're talking about assets on hand at the 28th of Feb 2015. Maybe that's what they mean. Assets on hand at that date. And you say, but what about all the other assets that, that weren't on hand, that were bought and sold in the meantime? But it seems to be they're talking about what's on hand, and 50% of the amount used to fund the acquisition of assets. They talk in the media release about seed capital. It seems to me that that must be the money you first took overseas in contravention of exchange control. <coughs> they don't say it, they seem to imply it. And the difficulty there is how on earth do you prove that amount? How do you prove it? Um, you know, for example, somebody might inherit money from an overseas relative. That's not illegal. And they put it in the bank. Then they add their travel allowance to it, and that is illegal. So now you've got this <coughs> mixture. So what is the seed capital they're talking about? No doubt they're going to have to be clear, or they're going to have to say, well, let the courts work it out. Who knows? But you've got to make a stab at it. And if somebody says, look, I don't have records of the seed capital, that I took money out of the country when it was three dollars to the rand. And now it's, I can't remember, I'm losing the track, 12, 13, 15 dollars to the rand. So you wonder what the seed capital is. So that's a little bit of an issue, um, but we are no doubt know what that means before the 1st of October. And you get an exemption of 100% of any foreign dividend, dividends, interest rate for other investment income received before 1 March 2010. Now, they talk about investment income, but they don't define it. Now, if you look at the Income Tax Act, there are different sections that define investment income differently. There's some sections that define investment income as including capital gains on the sale of financial instruments. But it doesn't include capital gains on the sale of fixed property, for example. Um, so, you know, if they say here, yeah, dividends, interest, rental, capital gains, or other investment income, it would be clearer. But they don't say that. Uh, accrued before 1 March 2010. So they say, all right, we're forgetting about income tax on those particular types of income before 1 March 2010. 
We're not forgetting about tax on capital gains, though, which then implies, okay, if I take this amnesty, do I have to also take the other amnesty to get my capital gains not penalised? You're still going to pay the capital gains tax, but you know, don't want to pay penalties, they don't want to pay, they want to go to jail. I think the jails are pretty full. I think the government just wants money. So they might put somebody in jail just to set an example, just to scare the daylights out of everybody else, but they don't want to put anybody in jail. They just want money. So if you've got enough money, you can buy your way out of trouble, but then you're not going to have much left. Uh, so if you look at, that's what's exempt. And you say, okay, so far, so good. But then it carries on. And it says, they must be included in taxable income in the first year of assessment ending before 1 March 2010. So if you're an individual, that's 28th of February 2010, you've got to put in the special tax return for that year. So you'll be taxed at the rate of tax for that year. And because we're talking about this amnesty, talking about assets outside the Republic, that's what we're referring to, this will have to be converted to RAND for the 2010 tax year, that exchange rate. So you might have taken money out of the country when it was three rand to the dollar, but now you're going to pay tax based on 2010, which I think is about nine rand to the dollar, or 11 rand, I can't remember. Um, revenues published all the exchange rates. So you're going to be paying to include, the amount to be included is 50% of the amount used to fund the acquisition of assets situated in the Republic that were acquired before 1 March 2010. I put that in green because there they talk about were acquired before 1 March 2015, but obviously they talk there about acquired before 1 March 2010. So it's that 1 March 2010 that they seem to be talking about there. And again, that's 50% of the seed money. And the, the tricky part is going to be, if you've got records to show what the seed money is, brilliant. If you haven't got records, revenue said maybe they'll accept an affidavit. I don't know about affidavits. I find when people are under pressure, you can get any sort of affidavit out of them. I inherited from my grandmother. She was in Iceland. She died. I would say, well, which has had the latest nuclear explosions. All the records are gone. Now yeah, my records are there. Um, you know, so affidavits, I don't know what's going to happen. But here they're including, there they exempt 50%. There they include 50% to fund the acquisition of assets. So if you know what the seed money is, brilliant. If you don't know, a little bit of a problem. Um, and then again, they don't say what seed money is, but I suspect they're going to have to say it's the first amount that went out. It's the first $100,000 you had. The fact that it's grown to a million dollars, that's fine. It's 100000 that went in. And that's what you got 50% tax on. So, and at 2010, the maximum rate was 40%. So, 40% times 50%, you're effectively paying 20% tax on your seed money. And the revenue obviously sees that as compensating them for all the income to that point in time. You might say, listen, with fees and bank charges, I actually didn't make any profit. True, but that's bad luck. So, that's what their little bit is. Now, um, that's the first part, the 50%, but then it goes on. Um, because they've exempted, because they've exempted income before 1 March 2010, it means they're taxing all income from 1 March 2010. So then you'd put in tax returns for 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, where you pay tax on the income from that point in time. And you get amnesty from penalties, but you still pay the tax and the interest on the tax from that point onwards. So, you'd say to the person, if we take the special amnesty, you've got a, rec a record-keeping problem with both amnesties. That's a problem. If we take the special one, this is the tax. If you take the normal one, that is the tax. You've got to do it. The only difference between the normal one and the special one, the special one, you only start taxing from 1 March 2010. The normal one, you go back to 1 March 2001. Now, you, there's, a, there's a paragraph here that I don't understand. It says the amount contemplated in subsection 1 must not be subject to normal tax in any year of assessment prior to the year of assessment contemplated in that section. 
normal tax. And that says, okay, what about donations tax? A normal tax does include capital gains tax, but it doesn't include donations tax. So that's a bit of iffy. And also, the amount contemplated in subsection 1 must not be subject to normal tax in any year of assessment prior to, obviously, Feb 2010. And I'm not sure what that means. Must not have been, or must not be, or does it mean it's after tax income? I'm not sure what it means. I'm not sure the draftsman knows what it means, but it, let's put it, he might have known, but he might have been writing this law three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I sometimes send out ideas three o'clock in the morning and be darned if I have no clients replying at the same time. Right, Philip, this is fine. I said, what are you doing working at three o'clock in the morning? What are you doing working at three o'clock in the morning? I just woke up with the answer to your problem. <laughs> can, we have, can we have a meeting tomorrow, Philip? I said, no, tomorrow's full. And next week, I said, next week's full. Okay, what about 3 o'clock tomorrow morning? <laughs> uh, find that. So, uh, but no doubt that will become clear because you do have the problem with the seed capital. Some people seed capital would have been out of income they didn't pay tax on, that they should have paid tax on. And some people seed capital, I would say 99% of seed capital, will be out of travel allowance, which is income after tax, which has already been taxed. So it's not quite sure what they're angling for here. I know they're angling for money, but let's just see how they're angling for money. That's a bit of an issue. Now, most people have... We started late. I've got two more minutes. They have discretionary trusts offshore. And there they say, discretionary trust, the donor or the beneficiary may elect that the asset held by the trust is held by him or her. And the reason for that is because the amnesty seems to say you can only get amnesty for assets you hold at that Feb 2015, Feb 2016. So if you leave it in the trust, you can't get amnesty for it. So you've got to elect to hold it. Um, we know for common reporting standards, if you have an offshore trust, the bank account of the trust, the bankers will say, okay, the trust, this is a trust bank account. Who are the people controlling the trust? It's euphemistic, nobody controls the trust except the trustees. But they want the name of the creator of the trust, they want the name of the protector of the trust, and depending on which country you're in, they might or might not want to know the names of the beneficiaries of the trust, some want to know the names of the beneficiaries who, who've got awards, some want to know the names of beneficiaries, whether they've got awards or not. Um, so, there's an issue there. So, those people might want the amnesty, so they've got to deem to have to hold the, the, the asset. So, if it had been acquired by the trust by way of donation, um, not by way of loan, sale on loan account, it's got to be by donation, wholly or partly derived from amounts not declared to the commissioner as required, derived from, so they're saying, okay, maybe it was out of after-tax income, but maybe you've added income to it, which should have been taxed under the attribution rules. Now, there's an interesting thing. Let's say you put money into this offshore trust prior to the 1st of March 2001, before we went on to the worldwide tax system, and you've done nothing since then. But since then, we've, you've, income's been earned on this money. If you put the money into the trust on or after the 1st of March 2001, and if we can pretend to read the law in a way that made sense, you would be taxed on the income that the trust earns on the money you put into it. They actually only got the law right in March 2003. Um, so you'd be taxed. But if you put it in before March 2001, and they brought the law in after March 2001, can that law tax something you did before the money went in? I think not. That's my personal view. The revenue doesn't agree because it costs them money to agree, it costs them money to understand that point. So they just don't agree. But to my mind, if somebody put money into a trust before March 01, the attribution rule shouldn't apply. They shouldn't have to go for amnesty. They might go for the normal amnesty because maybe there's donations tax. But even under this amnesty, it's not clear whether there's donations tax. Because if you deem to have held it, then surely you haven't donated it. I mean, how can you be deemed to valid it and also not donated it? I mean, have donated it. It doesn't make sense. 
but we don't know yet. We don't know how revenue are going to view it. They, they, they will no doubt say what they mean because they haven't exempted donations tax under this. They, they haven't. Well, these donations tax, but they haven't dealt with the penalty. But if we think about it, if I remember, there was no donations tax penalty at that stage. The nation's tax penalties only came in very recently, so maybe they didn't have to mention the nations. Because under the normal amnesty, you've still got to pay the donations tax. I'm not sure under this amnesty. You're deemed to have received the income, and the assets deemed to be yours until this one. The person, person is treated as having disposed of it. And the Income Tax Act says that on the day you die, you're treated as having disposed of all your assets on that date, on the day you die. So if you're a farmer and you've got trading stock, you pay income tax on all your capital and livestock. Um, if you've got capital assets, shares, property, everything, you pay capital gains <coughs> tax on the value on the day you die. It's because it's a deemed disposal to your estate. Now, some people have said, but what about estate duty? Because if you deem to have held it, then when you die, mustn't you pay 20% estate duty on the asset when you die? The way I read it, if you deem to have disposed of it, then you haven't got it when you die, so how can you pay estate duty? Um, of course, I'm reading it very carefully, and I think I'm right. But I've seen some judges' decisions lately that are, that are based by what they think the law should have been, not by what the law actually is. And that's a, that's a fault of, of, of a number of our judges. So they might say, no, but it means to be brought into the state here. But we are getting changes to the State Duty Act. They're in the pipeline, so maybe it doesn't matter. Um, right, let's see. I think I've had enough of me now. Uh, I've raised more questions than answers. Oh, there was one thing. There was one thing, one thing more. Final closing, closing thing. Yeah. I did a diagram. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I won't draw it again. Here's a chap from South Africa, goes overseas and he works. And he earns a salary from a company and he donates it to a trust. The trust invests it and it earns income. Now, this is where all the old notes on SA income tax books that I wrote come in. I hope you guys have kept it. I've kept all the income tax act from the year dot. Um, what is the tax effect? Because if you're doing amnesty, um, under the existing amnesty, you've got to pay the income tax you didn't pay from 1 March 01. Under the new amnesty, you, you're looking at 1 March 2010. Um, I'm, I'm, it's, it's more complicated than that. But suddenly, this chap worked overseas, he earned a salary. We've got a rule nowadays that if you're overseas for more than six months, it's 183 full days, of which more than 60 full days are continuous, your salary is not taxable. Prior to March 2001, it wouldn't be taxable because we were on a source basis of tax, not a residence basis of tax. Now the person donates the salary to the trust. From, I would say, March 2003, I know Revenue might agree with me, the, the income from that investment is taxed in the person's hands under our attribution rules. Question is, is that donation subject to the nation's tax? 8th of November 05, we, uh, we had the, the donation's tax exemption for donations of offshore trade income. That exemption was removed. So if you made the donation before the 8th of November 05, no donation's tax. If you made it after the 8th of, on or after the 8th of November 2005, 20% donation's tax. If you made the donation to my mind before March 2001, no attribution of income. <coughs> I think if you made it on or after March 01, it is an attribution. So you've got to sit and you've got to work out what's really happened here to work out the person's tax. It's not that straightforward. A lot of people have come to me and said, Philip, I've been a bad boy. And I'll say, okay, sit down and tell me about that. Tell me the whole story. And I'll say, you've done nothing wrong. You are, everything you've done is legal. There is, you've done absolutely nothing wrong. And they say, you know, my friend said when I was going to come see you, it's worse than going to the dentist. But somehow, I don't feel that. Somehow I feel relieved because I have lost, I, I didn't sleep the whole weekend before I came to see you. And they say, no, well, what you've done is perfectly legal. So what you've got to do, if 
somebody's in this position or not, you go to the account and say, look guys, this is what I've done, but you must be prepared to take the amnesty, you've got to. You can't say, well, I've changed my mind, I'm not taking the amnesty, it might cost you 40% of the value of your offshore assets, you've got to be prepared to live with it. Um, and you've got to say, this is what I've done, what is the tax? You might get good news, who knows? People seem to think that they're criminals because that is the way it's very much often portrayed, but often it's not. You know, guys, I'm a beneficiary of an offshore trust. I've never told revenue about it. I said, well, did you put the money into the offshore trust? He said, no, no, my dad did. Where did he get the money from? I don't know. I said, where's your dad? He said, he's dead. I said, so what are you worried about? They can't penalize a dead oak. <laughs> you can't help them now. You've done nothing wrong. The money's in offshore trust. You've got no worry. Have you drawn <coughs> money out of the trust? He said, no, I'm too scared to. I said, okay, now I've got good news for you. You don't have to be scared. You don't have to worry. And in fact, there's a way of drawing money out of the trust totally tax-free. He said, can I borrow the money from the trust? I said, no, that's illegal. That's a contravention of exchange control. But the trust can distribute certain amounts to you 100% tax-free. And they said, you know, I didn't sleep this whole week in worrying about this. I said, well, there you go. If you dealt with it, took your head out the sand, you would, have, you would have solved it long ago. And you could be quite happy. Then I'll say, can you give me a letter on it? With pleasure. Here's a letter, give it to the trustees. Based on these facts, that's the answer. And it's amazing how many people then can breathe easily. Because they didn't know that they weren't being crooked. Because, you know, you're reading the press, you read all these things. Luckily, our treasury is quite good. When the Panama Papers leaked and um, HSBC Geneva leaked, our treasury guy said, look, don't assume, this was treasury, don't assume that the persons whose names are on that list have done anything wrong. So I thought that was quite good. Um, right, I'm going to call it a day there. I've spoken more than enough. Thank you.